please welcome to the stage, founder of Exponential View, Azim Azar. Good morning, good morning, and thank you for getting here this early. I know the night summit uh, is always quite an experience to behold. Uh, my name is Azim Azar. I'm a technology entrepreneur and investor and advisor. And for the last few years, I have been asking the question, uh, what is the impact of all these amazing technologies that we're developing so quickly going to be on uh, society? And so what I'd like to do today is try to put that in some context for you, because we do live at uh, an amazing time. Uh, it really is uh, a time of quite rapid change and quite rapid fundamental change. And perhaps one way to understand what's going on and what's likely to happen is to start with the lens of what has happened previously. Now, over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to touch on that history, but I'm also going to touch on some of these technologies in computation, in material science, in gene editing that will transform our world. And it will get excitable at times, and I will talk about all the opportunity. But the lens that I want you to keep in your mind's eye is what is the impact going to be? Because that's fundamentally, I think, the most interesting question. So let's go back to uh, another exciting time, which was the Industrial Revolution in England about 150 years ago. Now, if you went back to just before the Industrial Revolution in the 1750s, the world had been, for several thousand years, quite an unrelenting place. Uh, it was in what was known as the Malthusian Trap. And that Malthusian Trap was this oscillation that we see on, on this slide, which shows the national incomes. We'd get a bit wealthier, and then we would start to have more kids, we'd have too many kids, uh, we would then have a famine or a disease, people would die off, we'd start to get wealthier again. And we sort of oscillated around that period for a long time, just able to manage on whatever the land could provide us. And then something happened, the Industrial Revolution, that transformed, uh, starting in England, uh, but also in many other parts of the world. It transformed our levels of income, as shown up there, and as we know, the population on the planet. I, there was a particular context uh, to that uh, at the time. So the context were that there were two particular classes of, of technology breakthroughs. Uh, one of the classes of technology breakthrough was in energy, so we started to harness coal more efficiently. We started to harness uh, steam uh, more efficiently so we could do more work with less effort. And the second was mechanization. We started to build machines that could be more and more sophisticated, starting really in the, in the cotton and uh, fabric and textile industry. During that time, we had a particular mindset as well, and that mindset was quite an expansive one. Um, in England, there was, uh, the, it was the age of the Enlightenment, uh, societies and science emerging, uh, scholarly men and, and women meeting and discussing their ideas. It was also the age of exploration, uh, and it was also, unfortunately, the age of extraction, because alongside the exploration came the extraction. And set against that mindset was a very particular political context, and that political economy only made sense in the context of those previous technologies. So we saw three key things. We saw a widening of education. People were taught how to read and they were given skills of numeracy. We saw a widening of the franchise. Many, many more people got votes. There was a, a, a burst in the creation of democracies throughout particularly the continent of Europe. And there was an explosion in global trade, the trade of physical goods and the trade of knowledge. And let me give you an, an illustration of that. So, so the deep tech of, uh, of the 18th century was, was chemistry. And um, before chemistry, we had this thing called alchemy. And alchemy is quite closely related to astrology. For thousands of years, we'd only known about 15 or 16 elements. I mean, the, the elements of the, the ancients, gold and iron and sulfur. 
And starting at the end of the 17th century, the middle of the 17th century, we saw this tremendous explosion of discovering chemical elements as the deep science of chemistry formed. So that by the time we hit 1850, we've discovered about 60 of the naturally occurring elements. 60 out of 92, we've pretty much got the whole way there. And that happened over a very short period of time. We went from not being able to, to, um, to, ma to manage and control metallurgy in about 1730 to having knowledge, awareness, and control and mastery of about 50 elements. And so think back to the background of the Industrial Revolution because it's relevant to what we think about what's happening today. So the background was, number one, this energy and mechanization, transforming our productivity. Number two, there was a sense of widespread improvement. The Industrial Revolution wasn't driven by individual geniuses. It was driven by lots of engineers and lots of tinkerers on the edges of countries uh, making small improvements. And the third was that we opened the world up to, to trade, to the exchange of goods and the exchange of ideas. So when we think about where we are today, we think about the technology boom of, of now, what's different and what's the same? So the first thing that's different is that there are many, many incredible technologies, battery storage, computation, machine learning, CRISPR, material science. There are many of them, and many of them are improving at an exponential rate. The, the second is that there's a combinatorial complexity that is emerging because we're able to map one of these technologies with another to create all sorts of new applications. And, and the third is that the trade and knowledge and exchange network that we've built is more fr frictionless than it ever has been. So of course, we have got the internet, which is uh, allows us to connect ideas from any two points on the planet in fractions of a second. But we also has we have physical supply chains based on so, uh, containers and uh, shipping and rapid shipping. That means that the shipment and scale of physical products anywhere in the world is faster than it's ever been. So if we think about the technologies, I've talked a bit about there being exponential technologies. And what I mean by an exponential technology is a technology that improves in price performance by at least 10% every year on a consistent basis. The one that we're most familiar with is Moore's Law, which for about 50 years is what has driven the creation of value in the technology industry. Because Moore's Law essentially says that every 18 to 24 months, the amount of processing power you get for a dollar doubles. And that has happened consistently for about 50 years until a couple of years ago, and it has driven down the cost of computation. And in driving down the cost of computation, it's meant we as developers can use much more compute, which increases the demand of computation, which in turn creates incentives to reduce the cost. But Moore's Law isn't the only um, exponential technology that's out there. I've got a few others. Um, Crider's Law relates to how much physical storage you can get on a solid state hard drive. And Crider's Law was improving at about 37% year on year. We've sort of reached the limit of Crider's Law, and so we have to look at new things like DNA storage. And there's Hendy's Law, which deals with the amount of uh, pixels you can get on a CMOS sensor for a digital camera. Uh, Moore's Law has been really fundamental to, to value creation uh, in the technology industry. But the thing that I found fascinating about, about Moore's Law and, and in a sense how we go beyond Moore's Law is that even as Moore's Law, which is this blue curve, started to peter out, the industry was able to come up with new engineering solutions, new architectures that delivered exactly the compute we wanted at a much faster growth rate. And that was with the GPU which was originally designed for the video games industry and is now used heavily in machine learning. And so while you see that between 1990 and 2010, a typical processor improved by a thousand fold, what you're seeing with GPUs is that between 2010 and 2020, there'll be another thousand fold improvement. But we're also seeing that the demands of AI and neural networks in particular is creating 
demands that even the GPU curves can't meet. And we're seeing dedicated silicon coming out that can deliver 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 times the performance uh, of traditional uh, approaches. And so AI is driving the flywheel of the availability of compute. If you look historically, back in 1985, when I was a teenager, the most powerful computer you could buy was the one on the left, the Cray 2 supercomputer. It cost $35 million, it weighed two and a half tons, and it could do about two billion floating point operations per second. Fast forward 30 years, and my Apple Watch is 100,000th the price, and 50% again as powerful. Now, the, the things that drove that fundamental shift over the last 30 years are actually more powerful forces for the next 30 years. So if that's what we saw in the last 30, the next 30 will show us even more. It's not just in computation this is happening. It's also happening in understanding uh, humans and, and our genes. In, back in 2001, we first sequenced uh, a human genome, and it cost about $100 million. Now, if the cost of sequencing a human genome had declined at the rate of Moore's law, it would have followed that blue line. But in fact, it's followed that red line, and it's now down to about $1,000. And it's, gonna, it's continuing to decline. And that's incredibly powerful, because if it costs $100 million to sequence a human genome, you're really not going to do it very often. If it costs a dollar, or a cent, or even less, it can be done hundreds of thousands of times a day, millions of times a day. We've looked inwards, now let's look outwards. There's an exponential growth in the number of satellites uh, around our, our own planet. Uh, what the curve actually shows is the number of privately launched satellites running from about 95 to about 2017 and how many are in orbit. This is critical because having a satellite around the Earth pointing back down to it and monitoring it was something that only nations could do. And the satellites were huge. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, in the last four or five years, they've become nanosats, cubesats. They're about this big. And they cost a few tens of thousands of dollars or less. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because we now have constellations of multispectral, highly censored satellites looking back at the Earth. And that means that we're not far away from you being able to access an API to get a real-time, 10-centimeter accurate image of any point in the planet. Now, if you're building applications, you can connect the, get those images, you connect them to some machine vision system, and you can do something useful with them. It's not just that it's cheaper to do today than it was 10 years ago. It wasn't possible to build applications using those technologies 10 years ago. If we look at battery storage, which is critical as we uh, think about making devices that can be untethered and autonomous. Well, battery storage is subject to the rigors of physical chemistry, and yet the price performance of lithium-ion batteries has been declining 20% year on year. So what we're seeing is a lot of different exponential technologies that are showing these sorts of price performance curves. The fascinating thing is that we can combine them all, and we can combine them all uh, using software. We can combine the genomic bioinformatic data we get through software with some other data to create a new application. And the binding glue of that software is now artificial intelligence. What we've seen over the last six years is that artificial intelligence has started to capture a whole lot of new sectors. And this chart is only visual to show you these are sectors on the left, obvious ones like healthcare and finance at the top, and less obvious ones like sports and um, property. And if there's an orange square, it means that there's startup activity combining that sector with AI. And what you see by 2017, there isn't a sector that people are not trying to tackle with software and AI. And at the same time, we are seeing these fundamental breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. If, Seven years ago, AI systems could not transcribe human speech as well as humans could. Today, we have Otter over there doing a real-time transcription of my discussion. Seven years ago, computers couldn't recognize objects and images as well as humans. Now they do it far better than humans do. 
And that drive is, is driving demand in the, uh, I, I, for, for computational power. If you look at the most breakthrough applications, uh, like um, the AlphaGo, uh, DeepMind's program that be defeated the world's Go player, best Go player, those systems are using not just a 10, 50, 100 times more processing power, 300,000 times more processing power than they were five years ago. And so when we think about one of the core enablers in deep technology, it is this ability to supply this amount of compute to AI. The final thing that creates um, significant impact in how our world might change is th the trade network and the fact that we've established this frictionless trade network, both with physical goods we can launch a physical product like a Huawei phone or an iPhone in dozens of countries at the same time, but also in digital si systems and knowledge because of the internet. I'll give you one example of the latter first. Um, if we think about the, sh the exchange of ideas, when I started my career 25 years ago, there weren't such things as academic preprints. So if you're a researcher, you might publish your research in a journal. It might take one or two years to get to press. And six months later, or a year later, you might present it at an academic conference. It's an incredibly slow process to disperse your knowledge. Today, what happens is that you publish your uh, research in a preprint on archive. Someone then turns it into code and sticks it on GitHub. People tinker with it and build little prototypes, and they discuss it on Hacker News. And then they might have physical meetups and show their tinkering, their experiments, their prototypes and in real time and in, in real life, exchange ideas with other people. And that whole loop might only be a few weeks. So we've accelerated the rate with which we can explore, disperse, and build on each other's knowledge. And of course, we've done something similar with physical products. The price of shipping goods around the world over the last 80 years has dropped uh, significantly. And so it takes us to things like this, which is Fortnite. I have a teenage son, so Fortnite has been part of my life. Um, less than a year after it was, it was released in beta, it was generating $300 million worth of profits globally every month. So when you combine all of these things, historically what we've seen is that the world's biggest companies have all been companies that are ba based on technology. And that switch has only happened in the last 10 years. And these are companies with enormous research and development investments. These are companies making breakthroughs in materials and machine learning and computation. But a second thing has happened, which is that value is being created faster than ever before. So all of the things that we have built that allow us to uh, develop these core technologies quick quicker, that see them improve faster every year, that allow us to combine them, and that allow us to distribute them, has resulted in a value creation boom. If you look at companies in the S&P 500, which is an index of some of America's largest companies, prior to the internet boom, the average company took about 24 years to get to a billion dollars in market cap. If you look at a range of everyday internet companies over the last 10 or 15 years, you see a downward trend for the length of time it's taken them to get to a billion dollars in value. So the, the vintage of Facebook, Facebook Palantir DocuSign 2004, took about six and a half years. By the time you get to Slack, WhatsApp, and Uber, which is 2008, 2009, it's taking about four years for those companies to get to a billion, a billion dollars in value. And then you're getting companies like Desktop Metal, which is in 3D printing, and Bird, which is a micro-mobility startup, getting to that billion dollar value in less than a couple of years. So that's a necessary uh, outcome of the way in which we've eliminated friction and developed techniques to harness these technologies and exploit them. Now, there still remain some significant grand challenges. Uh, you know, it's not all about scooters on, on hipster towns. Um, and so just a few of those. I mean, the single 
most important one is how do we deal with climate change and the warming of our atmosphere. But there are, there are others that are important. 50% of people uh, around the planet are not connected to the internet. 35% don't have access to regular clean sanitation. Uh, we have a tremendous issue with, with waste, not just plastic waste, in the sense that our economies are not circular. And we have aging populations and demographic challenges in a large number of countries, particularly advanced countries. D diseases of senescence and how do you look after older people. Now, I am pretty convinced that we actually can't solve those problems without the application of deep technologies, that we won't be able to solve and address climate change without, first of all, being able to figure out what that problem space is and then be able to get some help from AI systems to think about what solutions and optimizations might look like. And we won't be able to do that without novel chemistries and novel material sciences in order to sequester carbon or figure out how we build materials without being dependent on petrochemical feedstocks. Or how we maintain agricultural yields without using the tools of evolution like CRISPR to better hack the food products that we need to grow. So it's quite critical for us to understand how we harness um, deep technologies. But you'll remember at the beginning, I talked a little bit about the political economy of the Industrial Revolution. We also have some key political questions to think about as we go through and solve these problems with deep tech. And, and the first one that's most pressing is the problem that will arise as we develop these advanced technologies, which is of inequality. Because as these technologies accelerate, those who get them today will get much further away than those who get them tomorrow or the year after. And as they accelerate, that gap will grow and grow and grow. And what we know about inequality is that it creates political friction, it creates a lot of risk, it creates divided societies. We haven't had good answers for that with the old technologies that we have, but we're increasingly delivering technologies that can erect physical barriers within people, between people that can construct legal impediments, technologies that can now start to create interspecies boundaries between people, because that's where gene hacking might take us. And so as we step through it's this exciting, fast-moving pace where we can think we can solve some of our grand challenges, I think it's very important that we ask questions like, who are we building this for? What are we benefit are we trying to bring? Who's not at this table while we make these decisions? Uh, because I think it's important to get those questions right in order to solve these problems in a fair way. Thank you very much.